What I want to do this morning, uh, well, actually this afternoon, is finish out those insects that have a incomplete life cycle. This is actually because I, I actually wrote these as two separate lectures. Uh, we're going to finish out this first lecture that I should have finished on Tuesday, and then we'll finish the second lecture. So I will have a little break here in, in just a minute once we finish the orders of insects that are on uh, this particular chart. Again, remember, we're talking about these insects that have those three stages in their life cycle, egg, nymph, and adult. However, we learn in laboratory, if you have an aquatic nymph, what do we call that? That's the naiad. So naiads are aquatic nymphs, uh, and they are often a bit more highly modified and don't maybe look like the adult, like these nymphs look like the chinch bug adult. Uh, and the reason why they don't look as much like the adult is that they have to have body modifications, uh, things like external gills. Or in the case of the, the uh, dragonfly naiad, they've got those rectal gills. Uh, I still, you know, breathing in and out of your ass. Uh, that, that, that just is, is bizarre, but that's the way they do it. That's the way they, they figured that out. Again, what we're doing is, is this group here in the simple metamorphosis. We've, we've worked our way down through here. You'll notice that there's some of these orders that we haven't talked about. We're not going to talk about the rock crawlers, the gorilla blatteria, or the mantophasmentoidea. Uh, those are only found in South Africa. Uh, actually, one of my favorite insects are the imbiopter. They're called web spinners. Really cute little things. They, they look like sort of a brown termite, uh, but they spin web. They've got special glands on the tips of their front legs. And when they're walking around, they're always walking around with their front legs going like this. And they're spinning web and making a sheet of web. And they make these little tunnels and things with them. Really bizarre, incredible things. And just like what I mentioned with the Dermaptera, uh, they can fly, but they can only fly because uh, they pump blood into the veins of their wings and stiffen the wings. Otherwise, the wings are soft and flexible, and they have to have that because they make these little silk tunnels, and they have to run forwards and backwards in the tunnel. And if you've got a stiff wing in that tunnel that's not flexible and can flap back over, on, on the, uh, you're going to get caught and jammed up and torn up and so forth. Zoraptera. <laughs> I'm one of the world's experts on the Zoraptera. Uh, I, I did my master's work on Zorotypus hubbardi. Uh, it's kind of an interesting order. It has one family, one genus, and about 10 species worldwide. Uh, a really big group. <coughs> uh, and, and today what we're going to, to do is, is continue on uh, with these. And, and what I wanted to do is, is uh, give you a little bit further information on the mantids. Remember, we in most of the labs, we added the mantoidea sort of as, as the others. We didn't have it in the list. In this particular case, remember that they have the four wings modified for grasping. And the term that we use for that is raptorial. They are predatory, they have chewing mouth parts, and again, they have that gradual metamorphosis, egg, nymphs, and adults. When we talk to me about these uh, rearing insects, a lot of kids say, I'd like to rear praying mantids. What do you have to be careful with in praying mantids? They eat each other. <laughs> so if you're, going to have, if you're going to rear them, you have to have each praying mantid in a separate cage. And even when they reach adulthood, You've got to be very careful. You've got to make sure that the female that you're going to try to mate a male with is really full and fat. Because if she's not, she's not prepared to mate, and she'll just eat any male that you throw in there until she is big and fat and ready to mate. The most common praying mantids that we have here are the, and it's really kind of strange, our most common praying mantid that we have here in Ohio is the oriental mantid. It's an imported species, pretty good size, uh, and it, oh, I'd say maybe four, four and a half inches in length. Uh, the females are, just like with most of the, the mantids, larger than the male. Uh, the females usually have a, a shorter wings and, and uh uh, the, the wing may not even cover all of the abdomen. The males are usually very slender uh, and uh, have narrower wings, and, and the wings definitely will cover up the abdomen. Our other most common one that we have here is the Carolina manid. Uh, we do have a few of the European manids in the northern part of Ohio, but most of the small manids that I find here are the Carolina manid. That's, that's our one native 
praying, praying mantid here. Now, in, in laboratory, I brought in one that's this same species. Now, do you remember this morning what, it, what was different about it? The one we saw this morning was green. And, and so there are different what we call color morphs of these. Sometimes they're all green, sometimes they're all brown, sometimes they're this sort of model shape. Now again, I know this is a female because the wings don't completely cover the abdomen and she's got a really big distended abdomen, which indicates to me I might be able to put a male in there, but what I would probably do if I was going to try to mate her and get an egg case out of her, I'd probably put a couple of crickets in first and see if she was interested in eating them. And if she's not interested in eating them, then I'll put the male in and say, okay, try this. Prey manids also lay eggs in an oothecum. Do you remember that term? We talked about an oothecum when we talked about cockroaches. Uh, and, and here again, in this case, praying mantid egg cases look sort of like styrofoam. It's a, an artificial bubbly type of material that they extrude out and it hardens. It really looks for all intents and purposes to me as styrofoam. Why would they lay their eggs in styrofoam? <laughs> they have to overwinter. And so it's really insulation to keep those eggs from freezing during the winter time. Now they have some antifreeze in those eggs. They, they have some glycol uh, and glycogen in, in the uh, eggs themselves that keep them uh, from, from freezing, but having a little insulation is pretty good. They are really fascinating critters. They are, are extremely intent, extremely alert. They have very large compound eyes with lots of facets in it so they can see very well. They have binocular vision. You can see those, those eyes on both sides could, could tell how far something is. But even then, sometimes if you go up to a praying mantid, you'll see the praying mantid kind of do this first. And what it's trying to do is figure out how far away you are. Are you close enough that I can jump uh, to, to get on to you? And, and more importantly, you moved. How big are you? And when they say, oh, you're really big, they're going to try to get away from you. Our next group are the Blatoidea. These are the cockroaches. And for lecture, I'm going to combine the Isoptera, the termites. We're, we're going to... I'm, I, I'm having a hard time doing this because <laughs> I've spent my whole life knowing that, that there's cockroaches and, and there, there's, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, termites. And, and in this particular case, uh, I'm, I'm going to take my first little baby step and kind of try to put them together. In general, uh, the, the true cockroaches we see are dorsally, ventrally flattened bodies. They usually have very long, slender antennae. The wings are orthopteroid. Now, hopefully, since we've had class today, you know what an orthopteroid wing means. That means the front wing is elongated and blade-like. The hind wing is very broad and folded like a Japanese fan. And so, again, cockroaches have that kind of wing. Actually, we'll bring some cockroaches into one of our physiology lab, and we'll fly them. Uh, you can actually tie a little string behind the pronotum and lift them up and they'll start to fly because if their legs aren't touching anything they just assume they're falling and and so they'll start flapping their wings for us and we'll actually use a strobe we can take a, a strobe light and literally stop the wings so that you can see them in slow motion uh, in the laboratory they have basically what we would consider to be a generalized body plan that means the legs are, are made for running, and if you've ever seen a cockroach, they run pretty fast. Chewing mouth parts, again, that gradual metamorphosis, but in this particular case, again, remember that when they lay eggs, the female puts her eggs in an oothica or in an egg case, but then they have nymphal instars, and for most of these, we believe there, there's uh, six to seven nymphal instars, and then finally the adults. What do cockroaches eat? virtually anything that's of nutrient value. Uh, I've seen them nibble on the paste of cardboard boxes. Uh, when, uh, it's just amazing the kind of stuff that these things can feed on. These are also, there's, uh, while the vast majority, as you can see here, there's, there's only about 4,000 species of these worldwide. And of that 4,000 species, there's about 10 of them that are what we call paradomestic pests. 
Uh, that means they live in or around uh, our, our habitats. And, and the vast majority of the rest of them live outside, free living, uh, feeding on, on anything that they can uh, manage. Now in this one, uh, we see this large American cockroach. And do you see what the female is extruding out the back of her? That's that Oothica, and, and we used to think that they just held on to that until it was ready to, they found a good place to lay it, and, and indeed they do. But we now know that that Oothica actually has a little opening on one end of it, and she has intimate contact with that. She's actually supplying water and nutrients into that Oothica to keep those eggs hydrated and, and uh, developing correctly. And it's not until she does find the right place to lay that egg case, then she will finish extruding it out and stick it in a, in a place where she think uh, that the nymphs will have the best chance of surviving. Uh, there are some of the free living ones. Uh, one of the, the uh, famous one that I've seen when I go down to Florida, there's a real pretty green one that's down there. A lot of people down this call the, this the Cuban cockroach. It does occur in Cuba, uh, but it, it's also always occurred in, in South Florida. This one lives in trees and shrubs, and, and of course that's why it's green. It's really kind of hard to see until if you turn on a night light, it sometimes will fly into the night light. When you see it on the wall, it makes it a lot easier to see. <clears throat> Here are some oriental cockroaches. Uh, oh, by the way, I find it interesting that we've always associated cockroaches with dirty, filthy places. I view cockroaches like pigs. If you force a pig to live in a dirty, filthy place, it'll do it, but it doesn't like that. If you give it the option to live in a really nice, clean pen with fresh water and a place where it can go poop on a regular basis, it prefers that. It's the same thing with cockroaches. We, we literally force cockroaches to live under our stove or behind the refrigerator and, and places like that because we don't see it. We don't like to see them walking around. Uh, but if given the choice, cockroaches are actually pretty clean animals. And, and they, as long as they've got food and water uh, and a place to, to sort of hang out and hide out when it's daylight, uh, they'll do fine. Because of that, thinking that they're dirty, and they, they are, they pick up, their feet can get contaminated, their guts can get contaminated with bacteria and, and fungi and things like that. Uh, even viral bodies, they can carry some of those and, and regurgitate that on your food and, and so forth. Because of this, uh, people have given these different names. If you go to New York City and go into some of the apartments, it's very common to see oriental cockroaches running around. It's just one of the, the hazards of being in a big metropolitan area with lots of buildings, with lots of plumbing and steam duct systems and things like that that provide food and harborage and hiding places for these. But you better not tell the person you're visiting, oh, I saw a cockroach. They have water bugs. And if you talk to people there and you say water bug, oh, yeah, water bugs are everybody in this apartment complex has got water bugs. It's cockroaches. How about Florida? Florida, they have palmetto bugs. And I remember the first time that, that we were visiting some of my uh, daughter's friends and, and a big American cockroach goes running across the floor. And I go, holy moly, look at that American cockroach. And, and she almost went into a tizzy. Cockroach? I don't have cockroaches in my house. I said, that thing right there. Oh, you mean the palmetto bug? Okay. <laughs> In other words, water bugs and palmetto bugs are okay, but not cockroaches. In this group, we now have included what used to be the order Isoptera. It is now a suborder of the Blattoria. Uh, and, and so these are the termites. And we've talked about these in the laboratory. This is the first group that we've talked about that is truly social. That means that they've got these two major castes. They've got a reproductive caste, and then they have a worker-soldier caste. The worker-soldier caste are generally sterile. They're, they're not capable of producing eggs. But even there, we see that things can be rather plastic. Uh, we find out if, the, if all the queens disappear, the, the ones that are producing eggs, then some of the workers actually have the ability to revert 
they do have non-functioning ovaries in their body, but if they're not being suppressed by growth regulators produced by the queens, those ovaries will secondarily develop, and all of a sudden they can, they can mate and produce eggs. Pretty neat. The reproductives, remember these are the ones we call the swarmers, the ones that, that might leave the colony and try to establish a new colony. They are usually much darker pigmented because they've got to leave the, the colony and try to find a, a habitat to build a new colony. They're going to have two pairs of wings, uh, and those uh, two pairs of wings are going to be equal in size and shape. What's kind of interesting is that the wings have a little junction, a little suture at the base of them. And so when wing termites pair up, a little boy one and a girl one pair up, those will eventually be the king and the queen of a new colony. They actually shed their wings. They, they flip the wings and there's this little suture breaks. And then they can live in a colony without the hazard of having those wings around. Uh, some important features also of these is that people confuse them with ants. No, ants have elbowed antennae and a narrow waist between the thorax and the abdomen. Termites have the thorax and the abdomen broadly joined, and they have these little sort of straight or slightly curved bead-like antennae. Chewing mouth parts, all stages have chewing mouth parts. Again, they're going to have a gradual metamorphosis, but that gradual metamorphosis is, is kind of complicated by the calf system. Are they, are they going to be a winged one? Are they going to be a, a non-winged one? Are they going to be a worker? Are they going to be a soldier? And, and so forth. <coughs> the vast majority of these uh, feed on, on wood, but what did we say the one in the laboratory fed on? They actually grow fungi on wood pieces and they eat that fungus. They let the fungus do the digesting of the cellulose and then they eat the fungus. Those that do eat the, the, just the plant material or the, the wood fibers, they usually have protozoa and bacteria that are able to digest the cellulose and then they actually digest those protozoa and bacteria. Many of them also build some rather distinctive nests. Now, the ones that we have here in Ohio and most of North America don't build any obvious nests. But if you go down to, to South America, you'll see some of those big nests. If you go to Africa, you'll see some of those big nests. If you go to Australia, you'll see ones that, that build these very large, distinctive nests. Here's just a close-up of our eastern subterranean termite. Here you can see the workers. The workers are often called white ants. They're blind. Why are they blind? <laughs> They're living in the ground or in burrows and wood. There's no light there in the first place. There's no need to have any eyes, uh, so they're blind. Uh, you can see a couple of them here. There's uh, the head capsule right here, and you can see another one that has this enlarged head capsule and big mandibles in there. That would be a soldier, and, and that soldier's there to protect uh, the colony from other invading insects. Uh, uh, ants are ju usually the biggest predators that will get in to ant colonies. Over here you can see the winged reproductives. These are both males and females. And by the way, this is another big difference uh, in the isoptera or the termites as social insects opposed, as opposed to the hymenoptera. Bees, wasps, and ants. In these, the workers can be male and female. The soldiers can be male and female. And of course, the reproductives will be males and females. When you get to the Hymenoptera, it's a female-dominated society. Uh, the only time they produce males is when they want to mate. Uh, and, and we call them drones, because all they do is just hang around and say, feed me. Uh, do you need me for sex yet or not? And, and when that, that's over with, at the end of the season, it's kind of bizarre to go over to a honeybee colony, and you'll see all these drones around the opening and why are they there the females are kicked them out said we're done with you for the season we don't need you anymore go do your own thing and they go well i don't even know how to get food by myself and and they pretty quickly die uh, for that so uh being in a, a an ant a wasp or or a, a honeybee social bee uh, colony if you're not female it can be a little rugged now sort of as a side note What's wrong with the movie Ants? I love it. Oh, yeah. They're, it's, they're cute movies, but who's the principal character in Ants? Yeah, it's a guy ant. 
No! They're all supposed to be girls! <laughs> I know, it doesn't make as neat a story that way. Uh, so if you were going to have boy and girls in a social, termites are the ones that you'd want to do. Oh, here you can see the wings. You can see both the, the front wing and the hind wings. You can see a multiple wings here are the same size and shape, reduced wing venation uh, in there. Now here's our subterranean termite that we have here. And here you can see a, a queen. Now we don't have those real mega gastric uh, uh, queens that you see in Africa and South America, but she's pretty good size. Uh, she can still move around, but quite often uh, she's also kind of trapped in a chamber. Uh, she won't be able to move that much. Now here's her consort. Here's the king. And in ours, the, the original founding king and queen stay together. He'll periodically mate with her and, and so that she can continue to fertilize the eggs. If he dies, one of the other male workers will develop his testes and be able to mate. So it's kind of plastic in, in that. If she dies, there will be some workers that are developing that will develop their ovaries and they will become what we call secondary reproductives or secondary queens. Now here's a nazutiform type of termite. These are really bizarre little rascals. These are tree dwellers. And as you can see, what they've done is they've taken mud and what we call cartoon. It's, it's basically chewed up wood fibers to make a nest. That, that whole nest there is filled with termites. They actually have runways. You can see these extensions down here that will go all the way down the trunk, all the way down and, and around the tree and so forth. All they're doing is getting to places where they can chew on the bark uh, and, and pick up uh, leaf litter and things like that to take back in the nest, chew up and, and feed. Now we call them nazutiforms because the soldiers, you can see here, I actually, on this nest, I took my finger and just poked it into the nest and made a little hole. And the first thing that came out were all these soldiers. And if you'll notice, these soldiers are really odd looking. They have this big brown head capsule with what looks like a big snaw sticking out the front of it. That's actually a big gland that squirts sticky goo. And, and their idea uh, to protect themselves instead of trying to bite something is to gum up anything that's trying to, to get at them. And, and so I actually did, I went and touched it again, and boy, I had this really sticky gummy stuff all over my fingers. And, and behind them, are the workers that are rapidly trying to repair that breach in there. And I actually stood and, and watched this for a little while. And by the time the workers had finished that up, there were about 10 of these soldiers that were left outside. And as far as I can tell, they just sacrificed themselves. They said, um, you know, you close up this nest, we'll stay out here and protect it. Oh, you know, that wasn't a good decision. We can't get back in the nest now that you closed it back up. But that, that's, uh, they were willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake.